You're listening to the Morphology Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Morphology Podcast, aka Murph here to share interviews about biking experiences from cyclists who have pedaled to places all over. Each week, we'll get to know new people and explore new destinations to ride your bike. As you listen to these adventures, you may wonder, why haven't I done that yet? Well, have you heard of the Florida 500? This is an ultra endurance bike race that starts in Jacksonville, Florida, and finishes in Key West, giving riders over 530 miles of some of the fastest and flattest stretches of roads in the world. You can race the Florida 500 as a solo unsupported rider, a solo supported rider, or as a team relay with two, four, or eight riders. Today on the podcast, meet Dan Swenson. Dan is an ultra endurance racer who lives in the high mountains of Colorado, where he balances his professional time, coaching others as an endurance sports coach, owning and operating Dogma Athletica, a boutique fitness center, and also as a small business consultant. He did the Florida 500 as a team relay with Mike Garcia, and they won in their category. It took almost 27 hours for the duo to pedal 535 miles, complete with nonstop headwind. They took turns pedaling 40 minutes and then taking a 40-minute break as they made their way along the Atlantic coastline to Key West. Dan is going to tell us about his experience racing and winning the Florida 500 and just how important the power of the mind is while racing and living life. Here's my interview with Dan. A very warm welcome to Dan Swenson. How are you, Dan? Hey there. I am doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. Good to talk to you. Yeah, this is fun because, um, you know, we're podcasting together right now to talk about an extreme, in my opinion, extreme event that you did, which was the Florida 500. But we're also friends in real life. That's right. Uh, it's it's like going back a decade plus, actually. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, there were there were some uh, crazy bike rides that we have been on in the past, but I feel like we've both <laughs> moved on from those days. Um, will you tell the listeners where you live now and what c- cycling is like there? Sure. So I live in Colorado. I split time between Evergreen, which is a suburb of Denver, but it's way up in the mountains at 7,200 feet of elevation. Wow. And Edwards, Colorado, where I own a gym and high altitude training facility. And that happens to also be at 7,200 feet. So wow. the, the cycling here is just beautiful. Actually, the way I found the house in Evergreen was going on a bike ride with a business colleague. And mm. We rode up and saw the area, and I fell in love with it and told my wife, all right, I found the place for our new home, and that's where we ended up. And 7,200 feet, um, in my opinion, is kind of like a superpower. When you come back to Iowa, I'm assuming that you, like your lungs, are far superior than all of us Iowans. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm just drinking in the oxygen <laughs> when, we're, when it's down there at, at Iowa Elevation. <laughs> <laughs> and we should probably point out that, um, you know, listeners who have been listening to this podcast for a long time know very well about when I rode my bike across the United States. And uh, that was in 2022. But you joined us for a few days. That's right. It was um, it was really fun because me joining you in El Paso, that was the first day of what I call Dan 2.0. I had just left a 25-year corporate career the day prior, flew down to El Paso, and uh, my wife had left the car with the bike at the airport for me, and I got out of the plane, went over, uh, unloaded the bike, changed clothes, and rode over to meet you in the group that day. <laughs> and it wasn't just a little ride. I mean, you did a significant amount of miles to come find us. Oh, uh, it was like nothing compared to what you all had done, though. I mean, <laughs> starting from from California and being in Texas already at that point in time, I was just so happy to be able to 
join all of you in terms of uh, raising money and awareness for Alzheimer's. And it was yeah. just, it was so much fun hanging out with you all for the few days that I rode with you. Oh, God. Yeah, it was a blast. Um, and listeners can go back. Uh, maybe I'll put a link to some of the photos uh, where you're part of it, Dan, because it was, um, that experience still is just makes me smile. Uh, it was seeing the, the Marfa, uh, the uh, Prada store. Oh, yeah, Marfa. the Prada store, yeah. Right? Which that was, was super, super cool. And it, it really wasn't a store. Well, it was a storefront, but it was an art installation in Marfa, Texas. So in addition to uh, helping us raise money for Alzheimer's and being able to ride a little bit across the United States, you have been on multiple, dare I say, dozens of epic bike rides. And one of them was the Florida 500. That's right. Okay, so I want to know, for those people listening who have no idea what the Florida 500 is, because when I read that, I think of a car race. And I obviously know it's a bike race. (laughs) But do you want to give the listeners a little bit, like an overview of what Florida 500 is? Sure. So it is a 535-mile bike race that goes from Jacksonville, Florida, to Key West, Florida. So it's really, it's the entirety of the Atlantic coastline of Florida. Wow. Um, it's a, a straight through race. So there's no uh, multi-day breakup. It basically, the clock started at 6 a.m. on that Friday morning. And the first team across the line in Key West was the winner of the event. And I wrote down 26 hours and 56 minutes. And that's what it took you, right? That's right. So me and the teammates. So Mike Garcia, a friend of mine that I know from biking up in the Vail Valley area, um, he and I teamed up. We were a two-man team. So we did basically shifts of 40 minutes on and off the bike. We had a team following us. So we had two crew members in a Suburban that were following us. And so we would ride for 40 minutes. One of us would be on the bike. Then we'd stop. We'd switch off bikes, and then the other person would ride in the Suburban for 40 minutes until we would switch off once again. Okay, so the first question that I have, because I am, you know, I need sleep to live. If you're if you're riding 40 minutes and then taking a 40-minute break, what are you doing in your 40-minute break? Yeah, um, getting your hydration ready for the next time around, uh, eating something. And chatting with the teammates, you know, you kind of, you mention it as in like, Hey, you know, are you trying to sleep? Are you trying to relax? Yeah. Um, during the night. So around like 2 AM, 3 AM, I had a couple of shifts where I said, Hey, maybe I'll try to sleep during this 40 minutes. Kathy, that was so much harder to get back on the bike after doing that. Oh yeah. Versus saying like, Hey, I'm just going to stay awake. I'm going to chat with the driver Um, I'm going to actually kind of stay alert and active because when you would try to sleep for that 40 minutes, just your body would start slowing down enough that that parasympathetic system would kick in. Mm. And it made it so much harder getting back up to speed again when you got back on the bike. It was it was so much easier just like staying awake for it. Wow. And we need to point out that you and Mike Garcia actually won this event, which, I mean, congratulations. Thanks. We were 45 miles or about two and a half hours ahead of second place. Dang. When we wrapped up. Wow. And, and that was, that was even after getting caught by a drawbridge about a third of the way through and having a couple of the teams catch up to us at the drawbridge. Ooh, ooh. Well, and I know you well enough to know that you have that endurance thought process, the race thought process in your mind at all times. So were you, when it was your 40 minutes to be pedaling, were you going at, you know, as fast as you could? Uh, no. Come on, I bet well, you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, as fast as I could go, knowing that I had to go for 24 plus hours, right? <laughs> How do you train for an event like this? Uh, funny enough, the couple of Saturdays before the event, uh, so living in the Vail Valley and splitting time up in the high mountains there, mm-hmm. It's, it's really difficult to get outside and ride in the middle of February, right? So the two Saturdays before the event, I actually spent 
indoors. I uh, did 12 hour sessions of an hour on the bike, uh, on the trainer, an hour off the bike. Wow. So I was I was replicating what the race itself was going to be like, just to see how my body felt, to see how my stomach would feel in terms mm -hmm. of eating and consuming calories, um, and kind of sampling around with like, hey, well, how's what's the best way of spending that time off the bike, and also, you know, how hard could I go? for that hour at a time yeah. and still be able to keep going like once I hit the 12 hour mark. Wow. Okay. So you mentioned, um, which it's kind of, I don't know, it, it messes with my mind that this is called the Florida 500, but it was actually 535 miles. I mean, that would mess with me. Once I get to 500, I'd be like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so over 500 miles, you, you and Mike are, you know, zooming, um, in Florida, which I've done Miami to Key West a couple of times on my bike. Of course, it took me, you know, <laughs> a week to do it because I was not at race pace. Um, but for the most part, if you take off the bridges, that's pretty darn flat. So tell us about the terrain. Uh, it was quite flat, uh, except for the bridges. Ironically enough, I think I was the person on the bike for every single major bridge the week. Oh. <laughs> So uh, on the ride profile, like if you look at the map, uh, for the 535 miles, there was only 3,000 feet of climbing, which is not much at all, right? right? right. Pancake flat. When I got done, my Garmin head unit read 3,000 feet of climbing. So I think I did all the climbing. Oh, wow. Which, but, you um, know, in a nutshell, I mean, I guess if you really think about it, Sometimes it's okay to get the elevation because then you have a break going back down, right? It it was nice and kind of, you know, breaking up the ride. Um, you know, the, the big challenge of it physically was not so much the elevation. It was the fact that because of the wind directions, we had a block headwind mm -hmm. the entire 535 miles. So the, the wind was out of the south mm -hmm. as we were going between Jacksonville and Miami, which is almost like a straight shot south as the course went. Mm -hmm. And then once you get south of Miami and you get into the Florida Keys, the route starts hooking to the west. And about that time period, the wind started to shift oh, to be man. out of the southwest as well. So it was a, a headwind the entire way down. Wow. <sighs> Why did you decide you wanted to do this 500 mile race? Uh, it was an excuse for a beach vacation in Miami afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. And whose idea was it, you or Mike's? Uh, so Mike had signed up already. He did the race last year with another teammate. And I knew that he had some ultra endurance things coming up. And I've been interested in finding some more like 12 hour, 24 hour, uh, time trial type of races. So I texted him back in like December or early January. And I said, Hey Mike, do you know of any like ultra endurance races that are coming up in the February, March time period? And he wrote back and said, huh, it just so happens that my teammate for this race had to bail on me oh. and I'm trying to find a replacement. Whoa. And so it ended up working out really, really well in terms of the timing of me reaching out, the timing of the event. And Mike was just a, a fantastic teammate to do it with. Uh, and our crew was phenomenal. I mean, the crew was just absolutely great. In fact, we were going through Miami about 10 o'clock at night on Friday night, really kind of meandering courses that led us through the city. Uh, Cameron, our crew chief, was calling out turn by turn directions from a megaphone in the suburban behind me <laughs> to tell you which way to go exactly because <laughs> i kept making wrong turns the entire way down otherwise <laughs> oh man well and that kind of uh, is a good segue to my next question was to talk about you know you're in race mode so you're trying to you know complete this as quickly as you can but will you kind of give us an idea of what it was like as far as like vehicle traffic? Cause I'm assuming this is not a closed course. No, it's not a closed course. So we were on open roads the entire way down. Um, there were time periods where we were between the coastal cities 
that was really minimal traffic mm -hmm. and not much to worry about. And I mean, during the day, it was warm weather. It was 85 degrees, sunny. Yeah, the wind was in our face, but it was a really pleasurable ride. And then we would get into areas like around Fort Lauderdale or certainly coming through Miami where it was like stop and go traffic, oh, red yeah. lights all over the place. And there was one piece of the route as we were exiting Miami where it was almost like being on the interstate where we were on these major highways that had lots of interchanges and on ramps and off ramps. That portion of it, I was really, really thankful to have the crew behind us in the suburban mm -hmm. kind of blocking traffic and protecting us as we went through those kind of areas. I just remember when um, I did the ride to the Keys. Gosh, I just did it this past December. And there were times, you know, there's only one highway as you get further south. And um, tra traffic, either they just didn't see cyclists or it just felt like they were extremely close. So I can't imagine, you know, being out there uh, just as a solo rider um, without a support vehicle behind you. When we went through the Keys, for the most part, it was, you know, between 2 a.m. to when we wrapped up at about 8, um, okay. maybe a little bit later than 2. So it, there was no traffic for good chunks of it because of it being the middle of the night. And those time periods, it was really peaceful. And mm -hmm. it was kind of ironic when you're on the bike, you feel like you're just flying along and like your face is in the wind. And it's so energetic and energizing. And then when you're in the suburban and you're going 20 miles an hour in the car, it's kind of like, <laughs> oh, this is really pedestrian. What the heck? <laughs> but then we we got towards the end of it, and there's one section called the Seven Mile Bridge. I was just going to ask you about it. Yeah. So that piece of it, as we were chatting on one of the trade-offs, Mike and uh, Cameron said, oh, Dan, we've got to time this so that you're the one to ride the Seven Mile Bridge because it's going to be the most beautiful sunrise that you've ever seen because you're out across the water and the sun's coming up over your shoulder and the change of color from um, from night to twilight to, to dawn. And so I was like, I was all excited. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm all in. This is going to be fantastic. Well, we got there and it was a rain squall. Oh. It was 30 mile an hour gusting winds that were blowing me all over the place. And it was that was the one piece of it that was really frightening because it's only a three foot wide bike lane right. across there, right? Right. And you've got like this concrete barrier that's maybe three feet tall on the side that, you know, there's like a 50 foot drop to the gulf. And you've got traffic whizzing by on this two lane road. And that was another area where they pulled up right behind me and helped block traffic. <laughs> but even so, the thoughts going through my head at that point, there were a couple of times when I thought, what would they say if I just pulled over to the side and said, nope, that's it. I'm not <laughs> riding anymore in this weather. <laughs> well, and what I remember of the Seven Mile Bridge was how much debris was in that little space that you had, you know, uh, between the vehicle traffic and that cement barrier. Yeah, and well, and then add on to it the fact that it's all wet mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe a little bit oily. That's one of the times when I really kind of came back on my my thought process as it comes to endurance sports and in life overall. And that was one where I said, hey, just trust your preparation. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I had, I've logged so many miles on the bike and it was just kind of taking confidence in the bike handling skills and in my ability to push through that. And the other piece of it too was, it, you know, while I jokingly said, hey, what would they say if I pulled over and stopped? At a time like that, was, I knew that the only way to get through this is to keep going. Yeah. And that's the way it is with life sometimes too, right? When you're in the middle of that challenging situation, that rainstorm, and you're getting buffeted by the winds, and you have to kind of stop and think about it for a moment and say, you know, the only way through this tough time is to keep going, to keep, keep going, yeah, keep moving forward. Yeah. Do you have some um, really good memories or good stories that you want to share with us? Uh, from the event itself? Yeah. The entirety of the event was a phenomenal time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you go and you do these ultra events, you can get into that really dark spot where you're like, oh, this is the, the hardest thing I've ever done. I 
don't know why I did this. And you get done with it. And in the moment when you're done with it, you're like, all right, yeah, I got that done, but I'm never doing it again. And then a couple of weeks later, you start thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'd do that again. <laughs> well, for, for me, we wrapped up and I was just on such a high from the event overall that we crossed the finish line and I turned to Mike and I said, so are we coming back next year to break the course record? Oh, wow. <laughs> What'd Mike say? I, he was like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. And you guys, you know, even after spending that much time together, you're still good friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're still good friends. But, you know, the, the funny thing is, though, like, so both of us, thought going into it we were like oh this is gonna be great fun we're gonna get to hang out together but the honest thing is like Mike and I hardly talk at all because we would only see each other for the few seconds that it would take oh, sure. for one of us to pass the other as we were switching off we spent more time with the crew members we just had an awesome crew that it was my first time meeting them but they were just great people and some really good friendships were formed there so Mike and I determined we have to find another event to actually like do side by side together sometime. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's not like you can, he gets off the bike, you get on the bike. It's not like you guys can, you know, like hang out and share a chocolate milk together. You're like, go, go, go. We got to win this. You, it's enough time to say, good job, buddy. Let's go. <laughs> Well, you mentioned, you know, the, the rain issue, the weather and the wind, but did anything go wrong as far as mechanicals or, you know, getting lost or anything like that? <laughs> it's funny you should ask that. So we had no mechanicals wow. at all wow. for, the, for the bike piece of it. We ended up getting a flat tire on the Suburban on the way back to Miami. Oh. <laughs> so we were side of the road, the three of us guys trying to figure out, all right, where's the spear on this rental vehicle? How do we change it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and another, you know, like a segue of things that could go wrong is you, I don't know what the time span was, but you literally had neck surgery after this event. I had uh, neck surgery one week precisely after this event. One week. Wow. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I ended up having um, a herniated disc in my neck at the C6, C7. So it's at the, the base of your cervical spine. Mm -hmm. And it was compressing the nerve to my left arm. So my left arm, I had the combination of pain. I was in pretty much constant pain since November with this compressed nerve. Um, I had a 40% loss of strength in the arm, and it had even gotten to the point where it was the most severe form of nerve damage is numbness, oh. and I was developing numbness in my, my fingers and my left hand. So it was some pretty severe damage that was being done to, to the nerve from that compressed disc. I had gone into an orthopedic surgeon in January to talk about the options, and he said, hey, we could operate on this right away. But I had already made the commitment to Mike to do this event. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to back out on him. And so we scheduled it with intent that would be one week after coming back from the, the trip. <laughs> Two days after coming back from the sitting on the beach for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, but how did you feel? Like when you were actually biking the Florida 500, I mean, were you in numb and in pain the whole time? Uh, there were good chunks of it where I was in a pretty decent amount of pain. Um, I, we did it on time trial bikes. Now, on a time trial bike, when you're down in the aero bars, mm -hmm. um, and if you're not in traffic, if you're in an area where you've got clear roads, minimal traffic, you can have your head where you're pretty much in a neutral position with your spine. So you're looking forward a little bit with your eyes, but you're really kind of looking like across the front tire. Mm. However, when we would get into the cities, that's where you're having to lift your head up and because you're watching for traffic, you're watching for lights. And the lifting the head up, that would put the nerve in a compressed position. So, yeah, like going through Miami, that was a pretty painful 40 minutes on the bike there. Oh, wow. But yet you still did it and you guys still ended up winning. That's right. It was, again, it's one of those things where – Again, this is one of the translations of um, sporting events and what happens there and how you translate it to life. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's how, how do you deal with pain and discomfort in life? Mm -hmm. And so in, during this race, 
I took the mindset where I acknowledged the pain and I said, look, this is, this is uncomfortable, this is painful, but actually, r- rather than like getting worried about it or getting emotional about it, I actually took the moment to address it, to acknowledge it and to treat it as, all right, this is a sensation such as someone touching my skin or me pushing on the pedals or uh, the feeling of my muscles, you know, contracting and relaxing. And when you take a moment to objectify pain and discomfort, it allows you to then acknowledge it in a non-emotional way. Mm. And when you acknowledge it in a non-emotional way, you can, to some extent, you can set it aside and say, all right, while I'm experiencing that, I can continue to move forward. Mm. And this, this is really a big cognitive behavioral therapy tool that's used in helping people deal with disruptive emotions. And so it's the analogous of acknowledging that disruptive emotion thinking about and saying, all right, well, how does this emotion make me feel physically so that you can objectify it and then set it aside? The other piece of this too is, you know, those disruptive emotions, just like pain, they create um, an impulse in us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, hey, what, what is it that we impulsively want to do to deal with this? And sometimes those impulses can be really negative, right? I'm, I'm feeling depressed, so I just want to stay in bed all day. Mm-hmm. But then objectifying it and thinking about, hey, what would happen if I followed that impulse? What kind of outcome does that lead to? So with the pain in the neck, you know, the impulse was, hey, I want to stop. I want to pull over to the side of the road. Thinking about, well, if I follow that impulse, I'm never going to finish the race. Mm-hmm. And then instead saying, all right, I'm going to choose this different course of action. So if it's depression, well, the impulse might be, I want to just lay in bed all day thinking, all right, well, if I lay in bed all day, that's going to lead to a worsening of the depression. So I'm going to simply choose to, I'm going to get up and I'm going to make coffee, right? Mm -hmm. That one simple little thing so that then you follow on that one simple thing with, all right, well, what's the next step? All right, I'm going to um, check my emails or I'm going to read the news or I'm, I'm going to give my mom a call to talk with her. And then you start putting together those little steps and what happens is our behaviors, when we change them, they lead to a change of our emotions. Mm. And it takes time, but eventually we get to a better emotional place. So you think about racing, you know, I chose, a, uh, instead of following the impulse to stop, I chose, hey, let's keep going. Let me change my position on the bike so it makes the discomfort less. That allows us to keep going and ultimately led to us winning the event. Mm. It makes it obvious when you spoke like that, the power of the mind, because you went into this event, you already were trained, you knew your body could handle it, and then you just had to work through the issues with uh, your mind. That's right. It's, it's the mind is such a powerful tool in terms of, you know, if uh, you're familiar with David Goggins and his books. Uh, he had a phrase in one of his books, Can't Stop Me. He said, hey, when your mind thinks that you can't do anymore, you're only 40% of the way to what you could possibly do. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so it's, it is a matter of just redirecting those thoughts. And ultimately, as I said, if you redirect your behaviors, your thoughts follow along and ultimately your emotions follow on, along as well. And the cool thing about what you just spoke of is that um, you – Tell more than just yourself those sorts of thoughts because you're into endurance coaching. So will you maybe tell the listeners kind of like what you do when you're not racing across Florida? (laughs) (laughs) Or racing down Florida, I should say. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Um, uh, Let's call it three different things. So I'm an endurance sports coach. So I help others who are interested in taking on triathlons, um, marathons, bike races. Mm -hmm. I also own Dogma Athletica. Uh, It's a boutique gym and training facility in the Edwards area of the Vail Valley in uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a small business consultant. So I take all the lessons learned from racing, uh, my 20 plus year career in uh, corporate leadership and my experience as being a small business owner myself. And I help other small business owners with the challenges and problems that they face. Um, but of, of those three things, really the one where I derive the most personal enjoyment is 
the endurance athletic coaching. Mm -hmm. And a big piece of this is not only do I handle like the training and the plans, but I have a whole performance psychology curriculum that I take my athletes and clients through where we, we go through lessons on these type of mindfulness aspects and we identify, all right, how do you approach your sport with this? But we most importantly of all to me is we say, how do you approach your life with this? I was just going to say, I'm assuming your, your form of coaching um, puts those athletes into their minds as far as what they do every day, not just when they're actively exercising. That's right. So we have one lesson that's on goal setting and we talk about the athletic goals, um, but we spend more time really delving into process goals and the process goals, meaning like how do you approach these things that you want to get out of life in order to not just get to the outcome, but to enjoy the process Mm. of getting there. I was just on a conference call last night where somebody was talking about, um, you know, bicycling and not, it wasn't even about endurance biking, but it was just about biking and uh, why people bike. And it was the core of this person's presentation was to say that you need to find the joy in whatever you do, which helps you become better at what you do. If you don't enjoy it, then you're not going to like ride faster or longer or, you know, go into whatever you want to do, because if there's no joy, there's no reason. That, that's absolutely right. And in finding being joyful as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I choose that word joyful versus happy with very specific intent, because joyful is where you combine enjoyment, but also sometimes like the bittersweet aspect of life, right? Where you can go through an experience like with a bike race. It was, it was physically hard. It was painful at times, but it was a joyful experience because of like meeting the challenge and overcoming the challenge to it. Now, when you speak of endurance coaching, are you looking for new athletes or are you full? I'm, I'm always open to talking to people about what, um, what things they have that they're trying to accomplish and how I might be able to help them with it. And what sort of like uh, social media or websites or how can people find you? So people can find us uh, directly through the Dogma Athletica website. And so that is um, the two words put together. So Dogma Athletica and Athletica is A-T-H-L-E-T-I-C-A. Mm-hmm. So dogmaathletica.com. We also have the the gym has a Facebook and Instagram presence. So if you search Dogma Athletica on either of those, you can find them. Or just through uh, my Facebook and my Instagram profile, I'll occasionally put up things uh, that I'm doing for personal events on those two venues. Excellent. And what's next for you? I mean, you already said you're going to shoot for Florida 500 next year, but what's next? A quick interruption to tell you this week's episode is sponsored by the Buffalo Lodge Bicycle Resort. Located in Colorado Springs, Colorado, this is the outdoor enthusiast, ideal place to stay for fun and relaxation. The lodge is nestled at the base of Pikes Peak and just a half mile from Garden of the Gods Park. Learn more at BicycleResort.com. Now back to the show. So here is how on the edge and periphery, I end up living my personal life. So I had the neck surgery on March 1st. Um, My doctor just today gave me clearance to return to athletic activities. So I have the Iowa Wind and Rock uh, gravel bike race on my calendar for April 20th. And for those of your listeners who might not be familiar, Iowa Wind and Rock is roughly a 340 mile gravel bike race that there's no GPS download beforehand. They basically hand out cue sheets to the participants 15 minutes before the start of the race. So no preparation. And no preparation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if the race directors are the same people that have been in the past, but they are they try and find the 
craziest routes. I mean, the most elevation, probably some mud and some, you know, water crossings, all the, all that great stuff that goes along with gravel racing. Oh my. So I think it was last year or maybe it was the 2022 uh, route was 340 miles, but 30,000 plus feet of elevation. Gain. What? Yes. And so that matches well to what you would experience in Colorado. Completely different, right? In Colorado, you have these climbs where you're climbing for an hour mm -hmm. plus on some routes for the climbs here. This is a sawtooth profile where it is just constant rollers and punchy, punchy climbs all around that winter set west of Des Moines type of area. And uh, what did you say the mileage was? Over 300? Uh, I think the past couple of years, it's been right around 330 to 340 miles. And is it the same setup um, where you're not like, it's not a multi-day. It's meant to be a, you start and you finish, you don't sleep, that sort of thing. It's, it's straight through. Wow. And so they have a couple of different checkpoints where there are time cutoffs. The past couple of years, the winners have been around the 30 hour mark. Uh, and it's been a really high attrition rate. So they will have along the lines of 60 to 50 people will sign up and tow the line to start. And I think usually they get 10 to 12 finishers at oh, the event. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I probably don't even need to ask this, but is your surgery, was it a success? And are you healing well right now? It was a phenomenal success. Yes. So modern technology and medicine is so wonderful it was an artificial disc replacement that they did as an outpatient surgery mm. i went into surgery at 8 45 a.m i walked out of the hospital at 2 15 p.m the surgeon did such a, a wonderful job that uh, i didn't have any pain i had some discomfort post-surgery no pain um, i'm getting the strength back all the, the pain's gone, the tingling's gone, the numbness is gone. So my recovery has been going exceptionally well. And what's going to be telling is the next couple of weeks as I get outside and ride a little bit. Yeah. And I'll take a cautious approach in terms of making sure that the neck feels stable and that I'm not getting any notable discomfort or pain from it uh, before I really make the go, no-go decision for doing the race. Wow. Well, Dan, we'll be cheering you on if you end up doing Iowa Wind Rock. Is it Iowa Wind Rock and Gravel? Iowa Wind and Rock. Iowa Wind and Rock. That's right. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And we'll be sure to put your contact information in our show notes so that if people are interested in seeing your facility, but also in that coaching, especially endurance coaching, they can go check it out. Kathy, so, thanks so much for having me as a guest. Um, it's just been wonderful being friends with you over the past several years. I was so happy to get to hang out with you and the group when we were riding across Texas. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have to say, I really, really miss all of my Iowa friends. Uh, I can't wait to see you all again when I'm back to see family. Awesome. And congrats again on winning the Florida 500. That is, that is epic. Thank you. It was a fun experience. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Take care. Well, listeners, that's it for this week. Email me at morphologypodcast at gmail.com if you have a topic or the name of a cyclist you find interesting. Support my podcast at patreon.com slash morphology and visit both my Facebook and Instagram pages for daily entertainment. I have more great episodes in the pipeline, so I hope you continue to be a Murphology Podcast listener. Listener.